Welcome into 49ers Access. My name is Sterling Bennett, and today we are reacting to the San Francisco 49ers 23-17 Week 2 loss against the Minnesota Vikings. And I'll just say, watching this game was one of the most frustrating games I've seen in a long time being a Niner fan. Even when there have been games that have been tough to watch, they haven't been executing at a high level, or at least what the expectation we believe should be on the behalf of San Francisco, they usually win those games or find a way to eke out the victory. And this one, nearly maybe from the first drive of the game of the Vikings, you could tell this one was not going to be easy. It ultimately ended up in San Francisco losing this game by less then a touchdown worth of points, six points, could have had the win in multiple occasions, blew this one 100%. But I do want to start in a positive direction because there aren't many of those to discuss after the week two loss against the Minnesota Vikings. Uh, there is a clear cut positive of this game. And despite still not winning in San Fr or in Minnesota since 1992, uh, Fred Warner was just a dog throughout the entirety of this game. You can argue he was the only reason, one of the main reasons San Francisco even had a chance to win this game. Uh, of the 17 points San Francisco scored, 14 of them were due to them getting the ball back on subsequent drives after a Fred Warner takeaway. He forced the fumble later in the game on Aaron Jones at the goal line that could have put this game out of reach uh, and could have had this been a 20-point loss early in the game. Got the interception off Sam Darnold to get San Francisco some momentum just prior to halftime. And again, Fred Warner was simply just on another level in this game. Going through his box score, nine total tackles, seven total tackle, excuse me, seven solo tackles, one sack, one tackle for loss, two pass deflections, a quarterback hit, and again, two turnovers forced off Sam Darnold and Aaron Jones in this game. Fred Warner is PFF's highest graded defensive player through two weeks. He has single-handedly uh, been the takeaway machine on San Francisco's defense, and we all know how great Fred Warner is. And without Dre Greenlaw being out there, someone has to step up. And, Dre, uh, and Fred Warner continues to prove why he is the best linebacker in football week in and week out. And again, without Dre Greenlaw next to him, there were so many questions of how is this linebacker core going to play. Fred Warner has seemingly picked up the slack that Dre Greenlaw left behind due to the injury he has. So uh, kudos to Fred Warner. He doesn't need me saying that. He knows how good he is. Uh, and he was just phenomenal in this one. Uh, he is Top three in my defensive player of the year rankings through week two. Again, it's super early, but uh, Fred Warner has been on another level through two weeks of the 2024 NFL season. George Kittle was also pretty good in this game. Uh, the George Kittle train is always kind of an up and down one. Some days he's a blocker and doesn't get many re uh, receptions or stats that would make you say, wow. Uh, but with Brock Purdy, his career as a uh, as a receiver has somewhat been revitalized, even dating back to 2022 when Purdy took over against the Vikings yesterday in the loss. He had seven catches, which was second on the team, 76 receiving yards, had the lone Brock Purdy touchdown and only touchdown so far in the young season. I had a 25 yard catch and he had multiple third down catches to keep drives alive. I think George Kittle was really good in this game. I know he got taken out because he got carted to the locker room. It was only for an IV. Not exactly sure if there really is any concerning injuries uh, leaving this one. I don't believe he played in the final drive of the game for San Francisco. Eric Saubert was the main player uh, for them in that last red zone stint they had against the Vikings defense. So I'm not entirely sure if he's okay. There wasn't any injury updates after the game from Kyle Shanahan. So I guess good news there. But George Kittle was really, really good in this game. And there's always Debo Samuel. Uh, Debo Samuel. 
I do think his box score is a little bit misleading. Had the most catches at eight, had over 100 yards, um, but was utilized in a very weird way in this game. Didn't love the way Kyle Shanahan utilized him, um, and we'll dive into that more in a second here. And also Jordan Mason, uh, 20 carries, 100 yards, one touchdown. When you continue to not have Christian McCaffrey, uh, the running game really has not been an issue uh, to get going for San Francisco, Jordan Mason back to back weeks, a hundred plus yards on the ground, another touchdown this week. Uh, he was really good in pass protection. Uh, I'm not sure the situation or the play, but he just tossed a Vikings edge rusher to the ground and kind of said, you know, who's your daddy <laughs> a little bit. Uh, although the offensive line couldn't say the same for San Francisco, Jordan Mason was really good. And then Nick Bosa was fine. Had a couple of sacks on the day. Um, he did his job. He, he wasn't a game wrecker. Didn't take over the game on defense, although at times you wish he would. Uh, but when it's all said and done, we know Nick Bosa is usually one of the highest rated players on this defense and will likely be with Fred Warner as the top two defensive players on this defense week in and week out. Had a handful of sacks against Sam Darnold and got his first sack of the season early in this one. So a good day from Nick Bosa. Wasn't a great day. But certainly a good day, and otherwise, if I'm, being, if I'm being pretty blunt, you know, pretty piss poor outing by San Francisco. So let's talk about what happened yesterday. If that was the good, let's dive into a lot of the bad uh, when San Francisco lost 23 to 17. It's the first time that Brock Purdy has lost consecutive games, sets of games, if you will, back-to-back -back losses against the same opponent. Uh, he has yet to beat the Minnesota Vikings in his entire career. He's 0-2, both those games taking place in Minnesota. Kyle Shanahan falls to, I believe, 0-3 in Minnesota throughout his head coaching career in San Francisco, I think has only beaten the Vikings once, and that was in the 2019 division around playoffs. Uh, so uh, the Vikings have certainly given the Niners a lot of fits, uh, and it's not been great. Uh, but again, a loss is a loss. They're one and one. I do want to say this, that the sky is not falling. I was as frustrated as you were watching this game. It was like I was pulling my hair out saying, why can't we score? Why is Sam Darnold, of all people, being able to beat us? Why are players like Jalen Naylor and Brandon Powell getting clutch receptions on third down? This should not be happening against a roster as great as San Francisco's, which leads me to my first question, and this is definitely a shot at myself. Did we underestimate the Minnesota Vikings? Uh, I do think that week one always comes with a overreactions, if you will. Uh, that's what it's there for. You know, sometimes the, the Jets lose against San Francisco, and they win in week two, and everything's okay. The Bears are terrible against the Titans, but somehow win that game, then lose against the Texans last night. Uh, the Ravens are 0-2 so far. So many overreactions are happening, and maybe I was a victim of that. How could you not be? Football hasn't been played into seven months you're so eager to see a play and you go wow that team is terrible uh, the Vikings are not a terrible team I do think that San Francisco failed to capitalize on the opportunities they had to beat the Vikings and I want to make one thing clear that the Niners despite how bad they played should have won this game they had ample opportunities to win this game they didn't even have a single lead in this game, which there are a lot of concerning aspects and components of that. They've scored three first quarter points through the first two games of the 2024 NFL season, whereas last year they were the number one team in putting up points on their very first drives, which gave them the chance to either lengthen their leads in the second, third, and fourth quarters or maintain a lead throughout the majority of the game. They can utilize the offense in unique and different ways once you get a lead, whereas San Francisco has been kind of just trying to conjure up points and have been fighting tooth and nail just to gain first downs throughout the first two games of the season, which was not the case at all last year. But I do think that we have to give credit to what Minnesota's coaching staff did yesterday. The San Francisco 49ers, Kyle Shanahan, Nick Sorensen, Chris Forrester, Brian Schneider on special teams, they were outcoached in every facet of the game 
by Minnesota's coaching staff. Kevin O'Connell will always have those guys ready to go. And Brian Flores, who I said, well, I didn't love the secondary in Minnesota, and I definitely thought San Francisco had the chances to uh, make some big plays in this game or should have had an, an opportunity to slice and dice through this weak secondary. Uh, that was not the case. Brian Flores had a again, beaten and broken down secondary that has kind of been pieced together. They were all ready to play. Van Ginkel and Cashman were great as linebackers. The defensive line was just crushing San Francisco's offensive line. And again, the secondary was, I don't want to say locking up, but they had almost every single receiver and tight end covered for the majority of this game. So Brian Flores, who I think is one of the most underrated defensive minds in football, Gets an A++ in this game. He was stellar uh, as a defensive coordinator. And even Brock Purdy, who again, has never beaten a Brian Flores-led defense in Minnesota, even said after the game, uh, your scheme is crazy, man. <laughs> and you can tell it has definitely given Brock Purdy and Kyle Shanahan's offense fits the last few years. Um, he was awesome. Brian Flores was just great in this game. Uh, a lot of issues with... Kyle Shanahan and Nick Sorensen's schemes, although I do want to say Nick Sorensen in the defense definitely did their job for the majority of this game. Go back to last week against the Jets, talking about Brock Purdy. Uh, Purdy wasn't great in that game, but he played winnable football. That was kind of flipped in this one. While Brock Purdy wasn't terrible, he definitely wasn't good in this game. Despite what the stats may say or some people on Twitter may say, Brock Purdy had two turnovers and neither one of them were good. It could have been a lot more. Uh, it was not a great game by Brock Purdy, but the defense as a whole, I think, did play winnable football. They got big plays via Fred Warner, uh, peanut punching the ball out of Aaron Jones' arm. Uh, and there was ample opportunity for this defense to keep the Niners alive. And in fact, they did keep San Francisco alive in this game almost throughout the entirety of it. Yes, there was some bad plays that happened. Um, and yes, there's a lot of frustration that comes with losing. Uh, San Francisco's defense, despite having two takeaways and getting off the field at times and the offense not coming up and making the plays they need to make. Um, I also do want to point out that a top 10 defense last year that was supposed to be better, and they have shown through two weeks to be able to play better against the Jets in week one. You got beat by Jalen Naylor, Tyson Chandler, and Brandon Powell. You got beat by an offense that didn't have their three top offensive weapons in TJ Hawkinson and Jordan Addison. And in that fourth quarter, the Vikings didn't have Justin Jefferson. And in that last drive of the game, didn't even have Aaron Jones. So essentially, in one quarter of play when you had to get a stop, the Vikings didn't have their top four offensive players and you still got beat. Now, I'm someone that will say this wholeheartedly, that every team deserves a mulligan. Even last year, San Francisco, for as good as they were, they lost games three in a row, Browns, Vikings, and Bengals. Two of those games, they should have won. Two of those games, they easily could have won. This is a game they could have won. In fact, this is a game that I think if the offense was playing at the full capacity, even without Christian McCaffrey, you have the weapons to succeed. You have to play better. If the defense gets off the field on third downs in this game, you at least have another chance to let your offense that has been kind of stuck in the mud get an opportunity to score. But um, that brings me to the inexcusability that was the defense and the offense yesterday. Um, again, every team deserves to have a mulligan. Every team will, every great team will lose a big game here or there. We'll lose a game they're not supposed to lose. And you say, how'd that happen? And you're hoping that when it's all said and done this year, that you don't look back and point to week two against the Vikings as, had they won that game, they'd be the number one seed. Had they won that game, you know, they'd be the NFC champion. That is, although it's so early to even get that far into the conversation, the Rams lost yesterday. The Cardinals, who I think I was told weren't going to be that good this year, annihilated the Rams defense, which admittedly isn't that good, but the Rams look terrible. You could have got a leg up on them, two games up on them, which 
I know they're 0 2 and you're 1 1. You still have one game, but now you're not even tied with Seattle for the division lead. And sure, it's week two. We can't make too much of the early slate of games. Sometimes it takes about a month, month and a half to really know who's a contender and who's a pretender and who's going to suck all year long. My firm belief is that San Francisco is still a great team, but this game was definitely not the, the game you point to and say, uh, that's a tape kind of game. You don't teach that tape. It's a game you point back and say, we made a lot of mistakes. We have to tighten the screws up if we want to get to where we, we want to be when it's all said and done. On defense, uh, third downs in that last drive were a problem. Too many big plays given up on third downs in this game, but primarily, to me, the offense was just a mess. I'm not sure exactly what is going on with the offense. I'm not going to sit here and point blame and point fingers at you know 11 different players. A lot of things went wrong in this game. But what I am sick and tired of, and I'm not sure if it's because Christian McCaffrey isn't out there. Uh, I'm sure it's a combination of no CMC, uh, Kittle being injured late in the game, or but even then he was still good. But and then Brandon Ayuk not being able to separate so far through two games, has not been himself. And if you tell me he is or he's open, you're lying to yourself. He's just not. Um, he looks terrible. And I'm sorry, but he looks terrible. He, I'll rephrase that. He doesn't look like the Brandon Ayuk that earned $30 million a year. That's not a good Brandon Ayuk. In fact, and we'll dive into a stat here in a second, um, the Niners offense looks pretty bad. Yeah, they scored 30 points against the Jets. We hyped him up, and rightfully so. It was a great win. It was, it was one of the more impressive wins of the first week of games. But uh, so far, the offense, mainly Brock Purdy and the passing offense, is kind of stuck in the mud. Uh, obviously much more impressive and efficient against the Jets compared to this game. Um, and you can argue that the Jets, who have Robert Sala, a great defensive mind, and they have Ahmed, you know, they have they have Sauce Gardner, and they have you know a pretty... Pretty good defensive line. They're not great. Definitely missing us on Redick, but CJ Mosley and they have a good safety unit. Like the Jets on paper are a much better defense than the Vikings, but the Vikings came to play. And, you know, there are times that Shanahan struggles against certain defensive minds. Jim Schwartz is the main one that comes to mind. For others, it's Steve Spagnolo with KC. And now it also feels like Brian Flores is in that conversation of Shanahan just seemingly cannot beat these players, despite being very close to beating all of them many times. Uh, San Francisco should have won that game last year in Minnesota. Should have won this game in Minnesota yesterday. Uh, but Shanahan's scheme, and I'm not sure if you noticed this, um, despite Debo Samuel's eight receptions through the air, which led the entire team, despite 100-plus yards through the air, which again led the entire team, Debo had a pretty good game, but what I am getting sick and tired of seeing is, and this dates back to 2021, if I'm correct, that when you know Debo Samuels in the backfield is a wide back, he's getting the football. It telegraphs exactly what's going to happen. Now, that doesn't mean you don't scheme plays for him. It doesn't mean you don't try to get screen passes and end arounds. No, utilize Debo for how good and how great he can be at those things. I'm all for that. Thumbs up. Give it the green light. Let's go. What I don't like, and I mentioned this in the preview podcast, that Shanahan would need to have Debo Samuel as kind of a check down option at times, and he did that. But there was too many times, because Kyle Juszczyk also was a check down option. This team is missing a receiving back, hence why Kyle Juszczyk and George Kittle have kind of been that so far, at least in this game against the Vikings. But um, there were too many times in this game that Debo Samuel is in motion, doing this swing around the quarterback, usually on those plays. He's a kind of a screen pass to him, but then he was just standing in the backfield six or seven yards behind the line of scrimmage with a linebacker or defender standing right in front of him. So without Christian McCaffrey, with Brandon Ayuk not up to speed just yet, you are taking away your best and most important offensive weapon, which even with CMC out there, are sometimes still your number one guy you game plan games for. Um, you're scheming him almost out of plays. 
I'm all for utilizing Debo Samuel's strengths. I'm all for that. Great. They were about 10 to 15 plays, it felt like, in this game where Brock Purdy couldn't even look Debo Samuel's way and then nobody else was open. It looked like Brandon Ayuk, who cannot separate currently, Juwan Jennings, who we all like third and Juwan, he was fine in this game, but Juwan Jennings, for as great as he may be to us, cannot be your number one receiver in the offense. And without Christian McCaffrey, you're taking away Debo Samuel in certain plays. I get it. You want to use him as a decoy and find something else open. When that goes on for a quarter or two, which Kyle Shanahan is known to set up the opposing defense for a play down the road, and those plays aren't hitting, you have to change. And later in the game, that did change. But early on in the game, that was not working. I hated seeing it. And maybe it's because we don't have Christian McCaffrey currently, and Ayuk isn't up the speed where it's like, hey, someone has to pick up the slack. That player is usually Debo Samuel. Jordan Mason was good in this game, 100-plus yards, 20 carries, 5 yards per run. Good to go. Great. Love it. He took care of on-the-ground stuff. Debo Samuel, despite what the, the box score may say, there were too many plays that were telegraphed of, okay, the ball's going his way. Even their, their the last drive of the game where they scored the field goal, that screen pass to Debo Samuel in the red zone near the goal line when the Vikings have eight guys in the box lined up across Debo Samuel, that is a telegraphed play. There is no doubt in my mind, okay, this ball's going to Debo. Make sure you stop him. Now, I get Debo is a player that even when you know things are coming, he will likely find some way to score or get you a first down. I understand that. But without Christian McCaffrey, opposing defenses know if there's one player on this defense that will take over the game, it's Debo Samuel. He's going to be double, and at times in this game was triple covered. Yet nobody else was able to pick up the slack for him. Like The offense is kind of stuck in the mud where, not that I'm questioning who they are. They're a run-first offense that wants to use play action, but in this game only use play action 7% of the time, which is not good at all, um, or didn't make sense to me at all when you have 100 yards on the ground. But uh, this is a team that wants to run the football 30 times a game, 25-plus times a game, and hopefully uh, can utilize Purdy in play action, get him open on bootlegs, and get him and receivers free releases to get wide open. That only works if you have everything working in cohesion. The offense has not been able to find cohesion at all. And I can think back to 2021 when they were trying to integrate Trey Lance into the fold of things, Shanahan himself admitted that I can't find the rhythm. I don't know if that's the case because CMC is not in these games. He's going to be out for probably six plus weeks now because he's on IR. you got to find a way to find your offense again. And now I came into this game saying, okay, you know, Brock Purdy should be able to find himself a lane to, you know, cut through this secondary. That was not the case at all. Now, Brock Purdy had 300-plus yards through the air. He had a touchdown. Um, but, again, the box score numbers do not give you the context as to how they got there. A lot of garbage time minutes where the Vikings are in prevent defense. A lot of goal line stops for the Vikings defense, which the biggest swing or sequence of this game came at the goal line for both teams. San Francisco uh, is marching down the field. They march 15 plays, 94 yards. Take about seven minutes off the clock. They're marching. They're marching. Go, okay, this is where San Francisco finally gets in the end zone, gets some momentum, and they finally score a touchdown. Shanahan calls a shotgun pass, which doesn't make sense on fourth down. I will argue till I'm dead and old, right, that – a shotgun run on fourth and one makes no sense. Don't love it, especially with this team. And this issue dates back to Jarek McKinnon in 2020. You can look at Kyle Juszczyk's shotgun runs on third and one in the playoffs against the Rams in the NFC title game. Shotgun runs usually do not work. 
They don't make sense. It gives the opposition's defense uh, more time to get in the backfield, make and move your offensive line to their liking, and hopefully plug the holes where you're normally, if you line them puppies up in eye formation and let the offensive line, which, again, Jordan Mason had five yards per carry, and I get in that exact same drive. He did get stuffed somewhat, but my goodness, quarterback sneak it, brother. You need one yard. If you're going to go for it on fourth down, give your running back, who is known to fall forward, give the fullback Kyle Juszczyk an opportunity. And the five guys you have, six, seven guys you have lined up in front of them, the opportunity to open the holes, let Juszczyk lead your running back. Jordan Mason can't get you one yard? I am someone that will wholeheartedly say I want Kyle Shanahan to be more aggressive. In fact, I said after that Jets game, there were a couple of plays on fourth down. Hey, Kyle, if you have an offense that is stacked like this, I want you to be more aggressive. Kyle Shanahan went forward on fourth down three times in this game. He was more aggressive. I loved it, Kyle. I'm all for being aggressive. And sometimes you can't have your cake and eat it too. But if you told me, what are the odds that if the Vikings lined up 10 guys in the box and one safety lined out wide in case there's play action against your 11 guys ready to go in, you know, at the line of scrimmage, you know, who wins to get one yard? My money's on Kyle Shanahan's run game with Juszczyk and Jordan Mason. I digress. He doesn't do it. San Francisco doesn't score. A touchdown, they give the Vikings the ball back at the one-and-a-half-yard line, whenever it was, um, which maybe if that ball's not tipped at the line of scrimmage, it's, it's a touchdown, but calling a quick out on fourth down, not ever really the best option anyways. That ball can easily get picked off and run back for six, which, in retrospect, it kind of did. Uh, it didn't, but... The next few plays for the Vikings may have, might as well have been that uh, for San Francisco because just two plays later, the Vikings backed up against their own three-yard line. San Francisco calls a delayed blitz. Fred Warner can't get pressure. The entire defensive line can't get pressure throughout this game. And I'm sorry, Sam Darnold should not be, for as good as Sam Darnold may be, for as underestimated and underrated as he may be, he still has the arm talent to at least attempt a ball downfield. Even if that ball was incomplete, yikes! Even if that ball landed over Justin Jefferson's head and was you know, null and void, okay, whew, we escaped that play. The fact that San Francisco blitzing five to six players couldn't get any pressure against the Vikings' offensive line gave Darnold the opportunity to move up in the pocket, step up and make a throw with about 60 to 50 air yards through the, like, I mean, he he had George Odom beat by a mile, by a mile. It was just a disgrace of, of, of defensive scheming. It, it was a disgrace of offensive play calling by Kyle Shanahan and I'm sorry, um, I know Mooney Ward wasn't great in this game. We'll dive into that in a second. But uh, I never want to see George Odom lined up in man coverage against Judge Justin Jefferson or any opposing team's number one receiver. Now, to George Odom's credit early in the game, had a nice pass block or pass defense in the red zone at the goal line of this one to stop a Vikings drive. But um, even then, George Odom is a 30-year-old special teams specialist. He's a former All-Pro on special teams. He's your backup safety. He's a vet. I like George. But you have to expect that he's not Hufunga. He's not going to be this All-Pro Mooney Ward in coverage against Justin Jefferson. For as bad as their games were, Mooney Ward didn't allow a single catch against Justin Jefferson. Like, John Medor Lenore didn't allow a single catch against Justin Jefferson in this game. In fact, for the better half of this game prior to his injury, San Francisco held Jefferson to about three catches in like 30 to 40 yards. He wasn't doing much in this game, minus that one massive play that ultimately was the difference in this one. It's a lapse in defensive play calling. 
which I'm all for bringing pressure. And while it's a lapse in defensive play calling, it is ultimately a lapse in, I don't want to say outcome, but San Francisco has to get pressure on a blitz at the goal line. It makes all the sense in the world to want a blitz. Now, I will not defend Nick Sorensen allowing Odom and Jair Brown to have miscommunication, but also putting them in coverage against Justin Jefferson. That should be your number one cornerback 99% of the time. There is no excuse to not have your near all pro cornerback not on Justin Jefferson and mirroring him in this game. You can hate Steve Wilkes all you want. The one thing he did good was slow down DK Metcalf by putting Mooney Ward on him. Now, DK and Jefferson, there is definitely a, a bridge or a giant gap in between who they are as receivers, but ultimately, uh, you want your number one receiver guarded by your number one cornerback. Why would you have anybody else on the opposing team? Not just any willy-nilly, oh, he's receiver number one. He's the best receiver in the entire league. If you want to call a blitz, at least set your guys up for success. But again, Bosa, Floyd, Collins, Hargrave, whoever else is in on that play, they have to get pressure. That is that is football 101. Okay, guys, I'm calling a blitz here. They're going to take a shot deep. Mooney Ward, number one cornerback. Um, Jefferson, check. You guys also got to do your job. On that play, nobody did their job. That's how you lose football games. It was the difference in this game when you lose by six points. But even then, there was still ample opportunity for San Francisco to win this game. Sticking on defense for a second, um, the pass rush has just not been there. They had four sacks in this game. That's great. If you average four sacks a game, you're going to be towards top of the league. That's cool. Only 11 pressures? That's not good. That is not good knowing your offensive line, that being San Francisco's, gave up 17 pressures. There is no excuse as to why San Francisco's defense should be outplayed by the Vikings' defense. Yes, they're not facing each other. I understand that, but there's no excuse. The Vikings' offensive line last week came in ranked 29th. Now, sure. They're going to even out. They are not the 29th ranked offensive line in football. But my goodness, there were a handful of plays in this game where Malik Collins, who had a really good week number one, was just in the ground, stuffed, nowhere to be found. Leonard Floyd was nowhere to be found. The effort, while it may have been there, wasn't enough to bring home sacks. Nick Bosa, again, was fine, uh, but Yichir Grosmatos had a pretty nice game. He had three pressures, I think, led the entire team. Uh, but, yeah, you paid rather larger money for Leonard Floyd. You brought in Yichir Grosmatos, and you're paying Nick Bosa a ton of money. You are paid to take over games, to get to the quarterback, to pressure him, to force him outside the pocket, to make plays with his legs. Now, Sam Darnold did do that a handful of times. Uh, there's a third and three in this game, ran for about 15 yards. He, there was a third and nine in this game, ran for about 19 yards. Darnold did do that, but still, 11 pressures. The Vikings offensive line, compared to San Francisco's offensive line, looked night and day. The Giants played better against the Vikings offensive line than San Francisco's did. That's inexcusable. Now, it's week two. It's not damning. The season isn't over. Like, no one's saying, you know, game over, man. Shout out Bill Paxton and Aliens. No one's doing that. But there was a lot of issues in this game that we all say, man, like, that was not the same team that beat the freaking, you know, roof off of the Jets six days ago. On the ground uh, for the run defense, um, they did a good job stopping Aaron Jones in this game, held him to uh, a pretty mediocre stat line. What do you have? Nine carries, 32 yards. His longest run was nine yards. Uh, it was a pretty solid day against Aaron Jones. But then you have Tyson Chandler, who I thought would be utilized more in the screen game for the Vikings. Didn't need to be. Tyson Chandler walked into this game in the second half and carried the ball 10 times for 82 yards. Now, I like Tyson Chandler. He's a fast, speedy running back. 
But there's no way Tyson Chandler should have 82 yards and essentially ice the game for the Vikings. That shouldn't happen. Like This is... The Niners' run defense last year wasn't very good. The expectation this year was, you went out, you paid for Jordan Elliott, you went and brought in some defensive backs that can tackle, you know, you're going to have Yadam and Lenore, and you're going to have these tackling safeties. Um, Your safeties were not great in this game. And again, despite how good Mooney Ward was in coverage in this one, this may have been his worst game as a Niner in run defense. I cannot tell you how many times I saw Mooney Ward crashing to the interior while the running back Usually Tyson Chandler was cutting back outside and gaining 5, 10, 15 yards because he left his assignment. He didn't set the edge to force the guys back inside. Look, if you do your job and you force them back inside and they continue to gain yards, that ain't on you. You can blame somebody else, but you have to do your job. Uh, What's the old Bill Belichick, Bill Walsh saying? Do your job. You got to do your job. If 10 guys on defense do their job, but one guy doesn't, like Mooney Ward didn't do on a handful of plays in this game, it can ultimately cost you drives. Now, no one's blaming Mooney Ward for the loss in itself, but on second down, on second and six, if you force the guy back inside, maybe it's third and four. If you force the guy back inside, maybe it's a long second down. Mooney Ward was terrible in run defense in this game. Terrible. I don't care how well you do against Aaron Jones. Late in the game, third, fourth quarter, you have to get one more stop to hopefully give your offense an opportunity to go down and win this game. Who have been struggling the entire game to score, you got to bank on them scoring one more time. A lot of guys did not do their job. Mooney Ward was terrible in run defense. He knows that. He also made a comment in this game that, you know, he was kind of annoyed He didn't say those words exactly, but he kind of hinted towards, like, why was I not shadowing Justin Jefferson? Um, I can't defend that. That's something that I would say, yeah, do that. Maybe that goes back to the red zone, you know, stuff by the Vikings on fourth down and, of course, Jefferson's 97-yard touchdown catch. Uh, We already kind of talked about that, but Mooney Ward did seem kind of frustrated after the game with that not being the case, and hopefully Nick Sorensen, who is young, mind you, again, this is not damning on him, it's his second game as a DC, he'll learn to grow and learn to make the adjustments better. Um, It's been up and down. Really good game against the Jets and a pretty bad game against the Vikings, although winnable by the defense, but still, you got to get pressure. Got to find ways to get in the backfield and get the quarterback. That's what cost San Francisco three games last year in a row, not getting pressure and bad tackling, um, which ultimately led to bad run defense. Um, Run defense wasn't great in this game. Um, Aaron Jones was stopped, but Tyson Chandler, a number two back, feasted on this Niners defense on the ground in that fourth quarter, in that late in the third quarter. Just not a great day uh, on the ground. And again, you have to get pressure. Uh, But all that said, uh, it wasn't just the defense. There was a ton of mistakes. You know, despite San Francisco being in this game, they did not deserve to win this game at all. At all. This game really should have been, you know, 30 to 20 to 17, 30 to, to 14. This game really should have been uglier than it actually was. The box score, stat wise and score wise, does not tell you the entire story of this game, where if you didn't watch it, you go, Oh, it's a close game. Came down to the wire. Didn't play him that bad, whatever. Which, to a certain degree, was the case. But the box score, again, a lot of context left out in this. And this was probably the most mistake-riddled game San Francisco has played in maybe since the Browns last year. Maybe since the Vikings game last year, for being honest. Um, Purdy threw an interception, just forced the ball into a receiver that wasn't open. Um, Then that weird fumble interception where the ball just kind of slipped out of his hands. Maybe it's a fluke, but it still happened. Um, Jacob Cowing fumbles the punt. He's probably not going to be out there against the Rams. I wouldn't be shocked to see a player like Ronnie Bell out there on the field in punt returns next week because you can't have that happening. 
And I know Cowling doesn't have a lot of experience out there, but for a young player that wants to etch out that role, um, fumbling a punt on a critical possession that thankfully Isaac Yadam saved your A double S. Um, I'm sure the doghouse door is opening a little wider. You're going to hear that. Shanahan's like, welcome in, <laughs> go ahead. Um, definitely a way to get yourself benched uh, for a long portion of the season. So not a good job by Cowling on that one, but thankfully that didn't cost San Francisco too much. Uh, but one drive or one play that did cost San Francisco a ton was uh, a blocked punt, which I think it is the third blocked punt so far uh, in the entire NFL. So punt blocks or blocked punts are up in the year, <laughs> which isn't a good thing for the uh, special teams unit, but in this specific play, Demetrius Flanagan Falls watched the guy that inevitably blocked the punt run right by him. What are you doing, man? What are you doing? <laughs> like, look, I don't play in the NFL. Who am I to point fingers? But I can tell you what should and shouldn't happen. You see a guy running free, you put a body on him. It's like in the NBA. Someone's going through the lane. What do you do? You put a body on them. Step in front. Try to get a blocker or charge. All you have to do in the NFL, because they don't have blocks or charges, thank God, is just put a hand, put a body on the guy, and make him stop somewhat. He ran right through DFF like he was a hot knife through butter. And it was like, uh-oh. Then the, the punk gets blocked, and Wisnowski's like, I don't know how to compute. Do I touch him? Did I forget to play in the NFL? Oh, wait, this isn't college. Like, he's a robot. He glitched out and was like, uh, uh, uh. Like, look, Mitch, I get it. You're a punter. You don't want to get hurt. You had an injury during training camp, and Presley Harvin was killing it out there. But just touch the guy. You, you can kick the guy for all I care. Just give him a little booty tap. Just boop. Give him a little boop, and the play's over. That's all you got to do. Go back or fast forward to Ayuk's catch on the final drive of the game for San Francisco. Harrison Smith just gave him a little boop on the leg and the play was over with. Instead, he gets up and runs for about 15 more yards and sets the Vikings up for a score. Mistakes. Mistakes everywhere. Everywhere. And that isn't even the worst of them. Because despite Purdy's two turnovers, despite Cowing's fumble on the punt, despite the blocked punt, San Francisco was in this game until the final drive of the Minnesota Vikings. That's how tight, and that really shows you that how, despite how badly they played, San Francisco still had an inch, a sliver of hope to pull this thing out. But this game, like every game in the NFL, comes down to one single play. It's exactly what happens on third downs. In this game, the San Francisco 49ers offense was 2 for 10 on third downs. A combined 3 of 13 on third and fourth downs. You ask anybody, myself, media pundits, former players, they will tell you the most pivotal down in football is third down. For offenses, can you extend drives? Can you execute to keep the drive alive on third down? It keeps the defense on the field, makes them more tired. You sustain longer drives. You keep the ball longer. Essentially, you win the game if you usually win on third down. For opposing defenses, if you can get off the field on third down, your offense gets the ball back you give your team an opportunity and more chances to score. What did San Francisco not do in this game? Did not win on either side of the ball on third down. Again, 2-10 and 10 on third downs for the offense, 3-13 and 13 on third and fourth downs for the offense, and they are 9 of 26 of the year on third down. Again, 9 for 26 on third down this year. If you want to do some percentages, that's 34.6%. That's tied or would be tied for 21st in football. San Francisco, as of week two, has the 21st worst team on third downs in football. 
despite having Debo Samuel, Brandon Ayuk, and Juwan Jennings, and George Kittle, and a near MVP winning Brock Purdy. That is not going to make me happy, not going to make you happy, not going to make these players happy, and certainly, I guarantee you, going to piss off Kyle Shanahan. Then you go to the defense. The Vikings were 7 of 12 on third downs in this game. And I went and looked back at the game log in my notes after watching it, and I said, wow, four of their third down conversions, the majority over half of their third down conversions, were on third and seven plus yardage. Your defense did the job on first down, did the job on second down, just could not get the ball back for the offense on third down. You cannot allow third and sevens, not once, not twice, not three times, not even three and a half times, four times in this game. Did your defense get burned on three and seven plus? And two of those came in the final drive of the Vikings to ice the game. That cannot happen if you want to win. On the last drive of the game, Isaac Yatum was getting shredded. I'm talking by Jalen Naylor and by Brandon Powell, wide open, nobody around him. And kudos to the Vikings and Kevin O'Connell for calling those plays. Sam Darnold putting the ball where it needed to be. Kudos to them. But the defense has to be better. Has to be better. From Nick Sorensen all the way down to Isaac Yatum. They gotta be better. San Francisco in this game continuing with the mistakes they made. So you... Give the ball away ample, you know, twice, okay? You fumble, almost lose it for a third time. You get a punt and block, and you're terrible on third and fourth down. What else can go wrong? Oh, wait, there's more. Shout out Billy Mays, RIP. Um, San Francisco in this game on offense had at least six plays for negative yards, and I'm not including the six sacks they gave up. They had 12 plays at least for negative yards. When you're moving back, and you can go to the box score here on ESPN and go to the team stat page, San Francisco in this one ran 67 plays. A difference of 13 plays who ran 54 of the Vikings. Okay? You give San Francisco 12 more plays, the difference is those 12, almost 13 plays, went backwards backwards. You cannot win playing this way. Now, the good thing is all of the mistakes they made can be cleaned up. Purdy can play more safe with the football. The defense and the offense can be better on third down. You cannot give up six or 12 plus plays if you include the sacks of negative yardage. Sacks are going to happen. Negative plays are going to happen but you cannot continually move backwards and expect to go forward. That doesn't make any sense. This, this ain't Monopoly. This is a go right to jail. You ain't getting out. You're locked up for good. You can't fumble the ball on punts, but all these things can be cleaned up. And I think it all starts with the offense. The defense, again, played a winnable game. The offense had the turnovers. They had the punt fumble. You know, they had the third down issues more so than the defense did. The defense essentially evened the takeaway battle. They got you two. They gave you a chance, even though it was slim. You had a chance. You know, there was Jim Carrey sitting back saying, so you're telling me there's a chance. And the offense said, eh, whatever, forget it. Oh. And he fumbled the ball, literally and figuratively away multiple times. Again, the offensive line was bad in this game. Gave up 17 pressures. Six sacks were given up. It was a pretty bad day for everybody. McKivitz was just terrible. Terrible in this game. Uh, I think he allowed six pressures and one sack. Aaron Banks allowed a sack. Even Trent Williams, who was really good against the Jets, who kind of was like, look, I don't I don't need to have any offseason training. Really good against the Jets. Um, despite what PFF might say, he's pretty bad in this one. It's pretty bad. Um, there are a handful of times where, you know, not all the sacks were on the offensive line. Uh, there are a lot of sacks that were definitely coverage sacks by the defense. 
because nobody's getting open downfield for Purdy to throw to. But uh, even Trent was not on his A game against the Vikings. Uh, there was a time in this game where the defensive lineman kind of got him to spin around, and Trent did his best to kind of put his hands out and you know, kind of br- br- block for Brock Purdy. But even then, when your back is to a defender, you got beat. That happened to Trent Williams, which it'll happen from time to time. But in a game like this where you're kind of reeling, the offense is kind of walking through the mud, like trying to do everything they can to fight for every yards in a game where you're fighting for fourth downs because your offense is just not moving the football. You got to have players like Trent block Brock Purdy's backside. You got to have players like Jake Brendel, a vet, step up. You have, to, you have to have players like Debo and Purdy go, okay, you know, no, we're not going to get much help in this one. Can we put a drive together and win this game? Um, the offensive line, though, which is bad. Um, if you go to their total stats through two weeks of the season, San Francisco's offensive line, that again, looked pretty good against the Jets, is allowing a sack per drop back rate of 11.7%. That is the worst in football. Pretty bad. Brock Purdy is also the fourth most sacked quarterback in the NFL, just ahead of Gardner Minshew of the Raiders, Deshaun Watson of the Browns, and Caleb Williams. That is Deshaun Watson, who's terrible, Gardner Minshew, who's a bridge and mid-tier quarterback, and Caleb Williams, who in his first game held the football for like five seconds a snap, is bad. Really bad. Now, again, some of that is not on the offensive line. A lot of it actually is on the offense, not the offensive line, the quarterback, the running backs, and the receivers. People just simply are not getting opened for Brock Purdy. And at times, Brock Purdy is holding on to the football too long. Brock Purdy has an average time to a sack of 5.76 seconds. That is the second slowest time in football. There are times, in, even in this game, where the offensive line gave up 17 pressures that Brock Purdy had clean pockets to throw. Nobody's getting open. Nobody's getting open. That's a big concern of mine. And, you know, George Kittle made a point after the game in his post game press conference that was really concerning to me because. You don't have Christian McCaffrey. Obviously, your offense will look somewhat different. But it's not to say the offense wasn't really good without Christian McCaffrey. It's not like you didn't know you were going to have CMC in this game. Now, had your offense looked worse against the Jets and better against the Vikings, that would made sense. You thought CMC was going to play week one. He got there to the field on Monday night and said, hey, I can't go. Fine. Had you not been great in that game, which they weren't great, they were good enough, though, in that one to win, put up 30 points, nobody complained, we all celebrated saying, yeah, and yoo-hoo, but, but in this one, there's you had a whole week to prep knowing CMC's not going to be out there. Now, that doesn't alleviate the defense of the Vikings not doing a great job. They did. They were tackling great, wrapping up not allowing the Yak Bros to get much afterwards. They were really good. Really, really good. But when George Kittle says after the game, we won last week, we had opportunities to find ways to win today, we just didn't. But there's things we can't do with Christian McCaffrey. Okay, yes. There are certain things the Vikings cannot do without Justin Jefferson. Yet they still beat you. There are things the Vikings cannot do without Jordan Addison and TJ Hawkinson, and they still found a way to beat you. They knew those guys were not going to play, and they still found a way to win. I'm sorry, you lose Christian McCaffrey. Yes, reigning offensive player of the year. He's a great player. Okay, the sky's not falling. You're one and one in week two. The Ravens are 0 2. The Lions are 1 and 1. There's still plenty of time to climb your way back up the mountain and win the NFC. There is no panic button here. But when you hear that comment, is that an excuse of, well, there's no CMC, the offense is going to look different. I'm sorry, that's okay for an offense that has one, maybe two stars. 
Debo Samuel is getting $28 million a year. Brandon Ayuk is getting $30 million a year. You have one of the highest paid receivers, one of the highest paid receiver cores in football. You have one of the highest paid tight ends. You have the highest paid fullback. And you're going to have one of the highest paid quarterbacks who darn near won the MVP last year. And you have the highest paid left tackle. You don't get to say that when you have this much talent. Last year, without Debo, without Trent, you don't have your starting left tackle. Usually you can't win games like that. You play in an offense that Kyle Shanahan has been able to plug in any running back from Matt Breida to Raheem Mostert, who was on seven different teams, multiple practice squads, and you still found a way to win. Who was able to pluck Kevin Coleman off the street last year or two years ago against the Carolina Panthers, and he had two touchdowns. That's not an excuse. Your running back had 100 yards on the ground in this game. Sure, you don't have scenes in the passing game. I get that. You don't get to make those excuses when you have all pros everywhere on the offense, and you supposedly have this offensive genius, which Kyle Shanahan is that. These are games that great teams find a way to win. When you don't have your best player, your best offensive weapon, the offensive player of the year, I get that. Losing that player sucks. It's not good. You want him out there. It makes your offense more dynamic. There's no pushing back on that statement. But that isn't to say your offense shouldn't be able to score 17 points on the road against a secondary that has literally nobody in a darn near 35-year-old Stephon Gilmore as their number one cornerback. The excuse of, well, we didn't have CMC. I'm sorry. I get it. Not having CMC is going to hurt your offense. But, um, that doesn't mean Brock Purdy cannot have a better game. That doesn't mean he doesn't throw two picks or a fumble and a pick. Have you want to look at it? That doesn't mean Kyle Shanahan schemes Devo Samuel out of plays multiple times. It doesn't mean that Brandon Ayuk, who right now, despite being heralded as and has been the past couple years as the best separating receiver in football, not named Devontae Adams, has a fourth lowest Rated separation yardage grade of 1.9 yards. That is not excusable because you don't have Christian McCaffrey. You know, we all want to give B.A. a pass of, okay, we get it. Didn't have the offseason, this, that, and the other. Okay, it'll take some time. But now you know you're not going to have CMC. You do not get the luxury of time. Brandon Ayuk, and I love B.A., I'm so happy he got paid. It is not to say that I did not want him to get his money. Good for you, Brandon Ayuk. You're a great player. I'm a big fan. You look like you haven't played football in seven months, which it seems like because you weren't there through OTAs and minicamp and training camp, and you showed up after you openly said to yourself and the entire world that you made it harder than it needed to be when you could have been there because the offer was on the table on August 12th or 14th, almost an entire month prior to week one, and you continue to hold out and say no and try to eke out the little bit more money out of Jed York's pocket, which by all means, cool man, get your bag. You don't get to show up and be not ready to play and put on performances like this with less than two yards of separation against on paper, one of the worst secondaries in football, they might be in a great scheme. This is a defense that had better players on it last year and you played better against, but you held out longer than you admitted you needed to. And now it's costing the offense. Brock Purdy needs his number one receiver. That is not Devo Samuel, his highest targeted player, the past two years, to actually show up ready to go. That's a massive, massive thing that has to happen. You want to get the you want to get the ball out of Brock Purdy's hands and improve the near six seconds of time per sack, BA has to start separating. You want to get the ball downfield and take shots downfield, BA has to start 
separating. You want to improve a 17 pressure, six sacks day from the offensive line? Ayuk has to start separating. Yes, Ayuk has to get better. Jennings and Debo are not known as separators. Purdy has to force balls, and it's no excuse. Purdy was not good in this game. He was rather bad. The box score will not tell you that, but Brock Purdy was forcing the ball into a handful of small windows because he had to. That's going to lead to turnovers and takeaways by the offense and defense. It's going to make him look worse than he actually was, but even in this one, because nobody's getting open for him, he has to take chances and make plays, which inevitably is going to hurt him. Now, yes, there are plays you want to have back. There was a handful of plays in this game that could have been picks off of Brock Purdy throws that weren't. That's why Brock Purdy, to me, was not pretty good or very good in this game at all. Do I love Brock? Yes. Will he bounce back? Yes. But without CMC, we need near MVP Brock Purdy. And a lot of that starts with receivers getting open. Guys, mainly Brandon Ayuk, got to get open. We talked about before this game happened in the preview podcast that Brock Purdy cannot panic against Brian Flores' defense. He's going to bring blitzes, going to show blitz. He's going to mask everything. He's awesome. We openly talked about how this is going to be a massive test for them without Christian McCaffrey, and it was. Against four or fewer rushers, Brock was 18 for 21, 228 yards, one touchdown, and two sacks. Not great numbers. Many of those numbers were in garbage time, where the Vikings were rushing less players. He had more time to throw, and he can do some more things inside and out of the pocket to make some plays. Okay? Those numbers are still misleading, although they're better, as they should be, when the Vikings don't blitz. When the Vikings rushed five or more, essentially, when they blitzed, Purdy was 7 for 10, 76 yards, one interception, and four sacks. There was no one to get the ball to, because nobody's getting open. There was so much that happened wrong in this game, there was no pivot from Kyle Shanahan either. And that's what is so frustrating, that even when San Francisco's offensive game plan was not working, there was no pivot. There was no change. It was, come on, boys, it'll eventually work. Which at times, yeah, it will. San Francisco's offense has started off slow plenty of times, then exploded for 28, 30 plus points in a game. The Eagles game last year, he didn't score in the first quarter. They scored 42 points later in that game. It's happened. It's going to happen again eventually. But those games, you can tell there was confidence that it was eventually going to break. The bow was going to finally break. The gate was going to open up, and here comes the flood. In this one, it was nah. No, 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 no. Brian Flores is too smart. And the Eagles last year, albeit, you know, at the time weren't that bad. Uh, their defensive mind their defensive coordinator, is not Brian Flores. Everything the Niners threw at the Vikings, the Vikings had an answer for. They really did. Now again, this game was a drive or two difference from being a Niner win. There are things they can do to improve and win games like this. But I'm not buying the excuse of, well, no CMC, the offense looks different. It's going to look different. You knew it was going to look different. Losing him sucks. Stars got to play like stars. Kittle did. Juszczyk has outplayed Brandon Ayuk as a receiver. What's the excuse there? When you get Pearsall back, hopefully, you get Ayuk back to, you know, he's fully flushed out form, if you will. Your offense should look a lot better. I get that. There are things that are, are hindering you. Injuries for sure. I get it, right? But you don't have an excuse without the stars. You have too many good players, too much talent, too much top-tier high-paid talent to have games like this. You're going to lose games, sure, but they shouldn't be this ugly. 
it should not be you playing down to opponents. It should be opponents having to play up to you. And too many times under Kyle Shanahan, opponents have not played up to them. San Francisco has played down to their opponents. Dates back all the way to 2019, the Falcons. In 2021, it was the Broncos. In 2022, there were plenty of teams. Last year, Vikings, Browns, and the Bengals. The NFC is still wide open. It's two weeks into the NFL season. It, the sky is not falling. There is no chicken little here screaming, watch out! It's not happening. And there are things you can clean up. They have to get cleaned up, in fact. And I think they will get cleaned up. You have to get more pressure from your defensive line. They're paid to do that. They're too good to not get pressure. Bosa's too good. Floyd's too good. Hargrave and Collins are just too good. Mooney Ward has got to be better in run defense. Secure the edge, brother. You're the last guy out there. Let's do your job. Good things will happen. They're going to probably change up the safety room soon. Uh, Mustafa got plenty of snaps in this one. Actually out-snapped George Odom. Um, They benched Odom for a large portion of the second half in this one. Um, Maybe Hufunga's back next week. Who knows? Um, Would be a pretty good opportunity to kind of get him back out there and mix him in against the Rams, who he's played pretty well against over his career. And I think against the Rams, you know, what a better way to... Or what a you know what better time to play the Rams than now? You know you never want anyone to get hurt, but they're banged up. Three offensive linemen not going to play. No Puka Nakua, and it seems like no Cooper Cup now. If there was any chance for a get right game in Levi South, when your team's like, whoa, how did we just lose against the Vikings? The Rams just got you know thirty five burgered, if you will, forty burgered almost against the Cardinals. You can push them further down the standings. Get right against the Rams. You almost end their season. They'd be 0-3. You'd be 2-1. That's a really good place to be if you want to be the top dog in the NFC West. You make the Rams 0-3. The Cardinals aren't going to be good enough to last that long this year, but they'll give you problems for sure. They already have to the Bills and the Rams. But historically, Kyle Shanahan owns the Rams. Let's get back to owning the Rams and hopefully owning the rest of the NFL. It was an ugly loss against the Vikings. It wasn't pretty. It was frustrating. Everyone from Kyle Shanahan to Nick Sorensen all the way down to the punt return teams have got to be better. My hope, my faith is um, this Niners team is too good to have more games like this in 2024 They should bounce back against the Rams. We will discuss and preview that game later on this week. That game will be at Levi South. I can't wait to see that game on the red in SoFi Stadium for the first time in 2024. But again, San Francisco falls to 1-1 on the year. A rather humiliating loss against the uh, Minnesota Vikings, despite only being by 6 points, 23-17. But here we are. Week two is behind us. Week three is ahead of us. Bury it and move on. Bigger and better things are yet to come. Hopefully you can follow us on social media at 49ers underscore access is the X or the Twitter. Instagram is 49ers.access. If you want to go to any game this year and say you're in Los Angeles, you're in SoCal, you say, you know what? I want to watch San Francisco pound the you-know-what out of the LA Rams, and you want to go see the game this Sunday at SoFi Stadium, 1 p.m. kickoff. Use our promo code 49ersaccess, 49ersaccess at SeatGeek.com and save yourself $20 off your first purchase. If you also get tired of searching countless websites and podcasts and searching for everything on 13 to 14 different websites to find the latest news 
articles and podcasts about your favorite team, whether you're a Vikings fan and you're happy you won, you're 2-0, and good for you, Vikings. That's cool to see. Or if you're one and one saying, hey, how do the Niners bounce back? I want to find answers. What are people talking about? Go to sportsspider.com. They collect the latest news, articles, podcasts, YouTube videos, just like this one. And they put them all in one place just for you, organized by your favorite team. So go down below and click that link down in the description or go to sportsspider.com to find the latest news on your favorite teams. And if you haven't already, we're through two weeks of the NFL season, heading into week number three, and you're not joined the Locker Fantasy Football App League we have going. It's a $15 buy-in, but it's a jackpot of $450 that continues to grow once we hit 30 people. So we get 30 people in that league. Well, guess what? 450 becomes 500 then so on and so forth. An escalating jackpot. The more people you invite and I invite to that league that accept and join means more money to possibly win. $15 buy-in. Anyone can play. Again, $15 buy-in and let's have some fun. Click that link down below in the description. Download the Locker Live Fantasy Football app and join the Fantasy Football League named 49ers Access. Let's play fantasy football like never before. And click that link down below to get Locker Fantasy Football on your phone or any mobile device to possibly win big. Again, $450 escalating jackpot. Who doesn't want $450 in their pocket by the end of the 2024 NFL season? I know why I do, but I can also tell you this. There is one more thing that I will always be, and that is faithful. And as we end the show, don't forget to like, share, subscribe, leave that review on the podcasting platforms, Apple, Spotify. Give us five stars and tell us how you felt about this game. The Niners losing 23-17 to against the Minnesota Vikings in Minnesota. Still can't break that curse of 1992 down below in the YouTube comments. Tell your friends, tell your family. And as we await week number three against the LA Rams, as always, my name is Sterling Bennett, and stay faithful.